We're back for more back points. Here with one of the greats in Northern Virginia, Coach Brian Hazard. He's given his career to high school wrestling at Robinson High School in Fairfax County, Virginia, and he's got a lot to share about building a state championship level program. As always, please rate and leave a review for this podcast, especially on iTunes, because it helps us get visibility for the show, and get in touch with us if you want to suggest a guest who can talk about their journey to a state championship. Let's get rolling. He taught me to get up when I didn't want to get up, when I wanted to quit. I had high goals, man. I've always had high goals. And so when I won it, I was just kind of like, oh my gosh, you guys are right. So it's not the thrill of winning. It's the joy of having that personal goal and being able to achieve that and walk off the mat with your head held high and with your hand up. That just fueled my fire. And I was in every state championship match from there on until I graduated. That was when I really started doing the kind of wrestling that I was capable of. Anybody that steps in the ring and just decides to commit the entire time is a state champion in my in my book. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Back Points, the podcast where top wrestlers and coaches reveal their secrets about how they won state titles in high school wrestling. I'm really excited about this podcast because we're here today with Brian Hazard, who led Robinson to four state championships in 2010, and another four times Robinson finished second in the state. Coach Hazard is one of the best known, most respected coaches in Virginia, so we're here to learn a lot from him. Coach Hazard, thank you for joining us. Coach Marlowe, I appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to to being with you, and uh, Will, obviously, I've I've done you for a long time, Uh, not always as Will. But uh, but now I know you as well. And I think, um, you know, I'm excited to to be here and, and, you know, just reveal. Excellent. So before we get started, um, you might not remember this. I, I'm curious if you remember this. Your father had a show called I think I think it was called Matt Talk. Matt Time. Matt Time. OK, he was the first person to ever interview me. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. That was back. It must have been my sophomore year right after I I qualified for the state tournament. And um, he put me on the spot. He asked me to to uh, predict who would win between he wanted me to pick between Steve Kelleher and Reed Carpenter, two of the 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 toughest 130 pounders at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I picked Steve Kelleher. And uh, I stand by that. <laughs> yeah, Steve was Steve was an awesome high school wrestler. He was, he, you know, his dad, um, a, a great coach himself. Um, him and Mr. Rushing started the Bandits many, many, many years ago uh, from the Springfield Youth Club. So it's they, they've been around a long time. Well, maybe I'll get get one of them on the on the podcast, and they can tell us all about it. That's cool. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, I watched the other day. I watched uh, an. Uh, a documentary. It's called The Man Behind the Suit, and it's um, all about Mr. D. Prospero, Rob um, Bob D. Prospero, and and he coached the club um, Springfield, and then FPYC, and that made way to the Rams Club. The Rams Club was my dad's club. Um, he and Mr. Litley, and then Mr. Rushing came and helped him, and then they started the Bandits after Kevin and I uh, moved on to to uh, high school. So. It's, it's one of those things, and the band that's been around ever since. We just had Paul Bjorlo on last week, and he was talking about the Bandits and what a positive influence that was yeah. for him. I'm sure that was the time period, I would think, when – well, Bandits was very strong, I think, in the 90s, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, they were very strong. They, and, uh, you know, from probably 94 in, until today, um, it's, been a, it's been a really strong organization. So does the bandits feed into Robinson at all these days? Um, I hope so. Uh, we have, they, they've been our major club, uh, our major feed since, since I've been at Robinson and even before that. Um, but they've fed schools all over Northern Virginia and the, even in Maryland, even in, um, you know, in the years when Sam Smith was a coach, a lot of kids came down from Charles County, um, from La Plata and that area. Um, and, and wrestled out, um, out up in Maryland. So as a high school wrestling coach, what is your role in nurturing these youth programs, you know, the pre-high school wrestling programs? Because obviously as coaches in high school, we benefit from having strong feeder programs. What is your role in, in trying to strengthen the programs that feed into the high school? 
Well, I, I think, you know, you have to be a presence in, in those kids' lives. Um, it, it's so much easier to build camaraderie and to build um, trust if you're in the youth club room every now and then. Uh, I know one of your teammates, Pete Safros, runs an amazing club. Um, and, uh, and the Ramblers do a great job of making sure that high school coaches come in and work. Um, uh, I, I try to do at least one clinic every year. And, and for years, I did two days a week with the Bandits where I was either teaching, coaching, or just in the room. Um, now, I was fortunate enough to have two of my sons go through the Bandits program, um, but I was in there anyway. Um, and so I think it's really important that, that you know, your face is seen as, as they're moving up. So I knew you in the 90s. We met in the 90s. I wrestled against Robinson. Robinson always had tough t teams. You know, you it was always a very respected program. Something seems to have changed, though, around 2010. You know, when you started really, you know, you started, you won your first title 2011. So what can you tell us about how the program grew over the years to, to that point in, in 2010, 2011? Um, you know, that was a, that was after four years of really nurturing a youth program. Um, we had kids from Robinson that were in the Bandits youth program, uh, and they all came up together. And there was a, a really great synergy between those kids that, that started really the incline up of, of a great program. Uh, Sam Smith had those kids. I was in that room three, four days a week at that time, uh, working with those kids. Uh, and so, you know, we were fortunate to have 2009, 2010, we were second and, or third and second. And then 2011, 13, 14, we were state champs and uh, then second for a bunch of years. And then again in 2019. Um, but, but that was all due to the fact that we had a group of kids that came up together through that youth club that they were already champions before I ever got them. So, okay. So, so it was a process though, of, of taking the raw material from the youth program, which you, I mean, I know you're, you're being modest here and uh, you, um, you did, you know, you worked with these guys when they were in the youth program to a certain extent, because you helped guide that program. They came through and you, and you built the program around them to a certain extent. Is that? I would say so. I, I would say that, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not really being very humble. Uh, Sam Smith and, and, and uh, Dennis Harlow and his son, Dane, you know, was a state champ for Annandale uh, and several other coaches. They started that program with the Bandits and they were taking those kids to national tournaments way before I ever got my hooks into them. Um, and so they were just a great group of kids. Now, did did we have to do some some fine tuning? Absolutely. And that's that's a job of a coach. But they were good well before I got them. Um, you know, we, we had some good years before that. Uh, you know, we were top five in the state probably five or six times. My first year was 1996, 1997, and we were a top five team four or five times in that. Uh, but really getting over the hump was the years where we had that, that youth group coming up. So when you get a group of guys who are really talented and they're really experienced before they get into high school, what is what is the role of the coach at that point? You know, do you you know, do you want them to wrestle your style? No, it's it's being a puppet master. Uh, it's it's giving them Jedi mind tricks. <laughs> it's uh, it's really um, I would say when you have that much talent, it's really monitoring that talent and making sure that um the egos don't get too big. Um, you know, we had years 2009, 2010, where we were having wrestle offs um, between two, two state place winners and not even like a low state place winner. We're talking top three kids wow. just for a spot on the team. Um, you know, 2011, uh, you know, between 112 and 145, uh, <laughs> We had kids, you know, my, we had one of our 130 pounders wrestling 145. He was having to eat every day and he got, you know, sixth in the state, ended up being a state champ as Zach D. Pasquale. But, um, you know, it's really just making sure that those kids are, are on the same line, uh, are working as a team. And you can have great individuals and have a really poor team. And, we, you know, so you really have to build that camaraderie, that, that teamwork 
um, for, for a great team. And, and they, those type of teams don't come very often. And we were fortunate to have them all come in the same year and go four years together. Um, in one of the years, we had two, three of the kids move away. They end up moving back, military things and, and some other issues. Um, but then we were second in, in 2012 with a group of kids that, uh, you know, really fed the program and with leadership. Well, so at this point, though, it's been eight years, nine years that you've been top one, top two in the state yeah. pretty consistently. So at that point, does it feed off itself? Does it help with recruiting? Do you use the championships to try to draw more kids in? Sure, absolutely. You uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, working with the youth club or, or whether working with the community, um, kids want to be a part of something that wins and they want to be a part of something that's respected. Um and, and, you know, I think we'll probably talk a little bit about that later, um, just about, you know, not every every kid needs to have a role in, in that. And some kids, it's not being a state champ. And some kids, it's not even being a starter. It's being that role player. Um, but I, I would say that, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of different cogs to, to build that program. So I, I'm interested in that. So why do you – so um, – so I think everybody sees the state champions. Obviously, everybody sees the superstars. What are some of the other critical roles on the team? Uh, you know, you got to have, I think, something that we've built. And we've had years where we've had ridiculously good leadership. And we've had years where it's been lacking. And you really have to, you really have to try to build it. But, you know, you got to have your role players. you got to have that vocal leader, that, that locker room guy um, or girl. You have to have... Um, the kid who is unashamedly and unafraid to get into somebody's face and tell them what needs to be done. You have to have that guy and or that girl who, um, you know, is the tutor of the team when we have study hall every day. You know, and they, they're the ones uh, we've had. We were fortunate enough to have a lot of kids going through Ivy League schools or going through military academies who are just ridiculously brilliant. And they, they tutor it or they just set that expectation with grades. Um, you know, you have to have those kids who um, will be lemmings and will completely follow. Uh, and and will, regardless of what is said, they're going to go and say, yes, I'll do it. And then you also have to have the kids who question. Because as coaches, we don't know everything. And I, I tell this to my to, to the people who coach with me and the kids on the team. If you see something that you're questioning or you don't like, ask. Now you ask it in a certain way, right? Don't just go and say, "Hey, you sob, you, you know, you did this wrong." Uh, but questioning is a good thing. Um, maybe my first five to eight years, I didn't really like people to question me. I, I wanted them to know, um, you know, what was up and and how it was going to be. And then I think as we went along, I had some great people who did question what I said. Um, just like whether it's kids on the team or whether it's coaches, I think. Um, I like to carry five to six assistant coaches and mm -hmm. those assistant coaches aren't workout partners. You know, hopefully they, they're going to teach and they're going to work out some, but you know, you have your guy who's going to be in charge of gear and who's going to be really, uh, you know, doing the ordering piece. You're going to have that person who's in charge of checking kids grades and making sure that they're in, in, in their classes. You need to have the, that, uh, that assistant coach who makes sure that for me, logistics are there, you know, we, we know when we're going, what, how we're going and where we're going. Um, and, 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 you know, you have to have those really knowledgeable coaches who are just technique freaks and, yeah. but not, they don't all have to be technique freaks. I've had guys who have never wrestled before as assistant coaches who, who are just really great rah-rah guys and who sit on the bench and, you know, uh, kids love them. So uh, I think that those are all important roles. How long do your assistant coaches stick with you typically? Do you have long-term, super long-term assistants? So uh, my first assistant coach, Doug Fisher, and he's now the coach at Falk Year. He's won several state titles out there. We were together for 11 years. Uh, Drew Foster has been with me for 17 years of my 24. Uh, Brian Amis, who's now a principal out in Boise, Idaho, was with me for 13 years. Um, and then we have others uh, who – like Justin DiNicola, who's now an assistant coach over at um, Woodson, he was with us for 10 years. So I think it's important that you have those, that consistency. 
And then I have some young guys who come in two, three years, you know, like a, a Luke Ludke. And now we've had Greg Flournoy from Mason for the last uh, three years. Hopefully he'll stick around for a long time. I had Rich Riggs, Sam Smith, Steve Wilcox. They've been around for a long time, uh, really kind of since we've gotten all this going. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think it's important that you have that consistency in a coaching staff. Uh, you build that system together uh, and, and you bounce it off each other. So it sounds to me like you've got a very organized wrestling room. To, that's what it sounds like from the outside here. Um, how, if you get a guy, if you get a wrestler who's never wrestled a day in his life, but he's athletic, he's got good talent. Um, do you, how, how, what kind of a program do you put them through? How organized and, and consistent is the training that you want to give that new wrestler who you see a lot of talent in? See, it's changed so much. Um, when I first got started coaching, we put everybody together in the same room, whether we had 30 or we had 70, we had one practice room and we have a small room and those really great athletes who didn't know what the heck they were doing. We lost them because they, they didn't succeed and they couldn't go through the hard practices. So over the last 13, 14 years, uh, we've run two practices, and fortunately, I've had Brian Amis and, a, and, a, and especially a Drew Foster who have run that young group, and they have a system that they do with them. Uh, hour and a half practices, no longer than an hour and a half. They run from 3 to 4.30, and uh, once they see some a lot of success on that JV level, then we'll move them up. Uh, I hate forfeits, but I'd rather forfeit a weight than put a guy out there who's not ready and who's not prepared uh, mm-hmm. to be in a varsity level. Because kids, um, regardless of how great their experience is in the wrestling room and with the kids, if they're if they're getting their tail beat in every day, th- they're not going to stay. I agree. I think there's a um, a real process to establishing confidence. Yes. And if you take a kid out and have him get demolished against somebody who is is clearly farther along than they are, I think that can be have a negative impact. Is that? Is that kind of what you're thinking? They just, I mean, you'll never get them back. In my opinion, you'll never get them back. Uh, and, and, And so it's really difficult sometimes to have a kid who crushes it on the JV level and then goes out to varsity and gets beat up. You got to put them back down. It's kind of like the minor leagues, right? You got to put them back down to triple A, double A to get that confidence back behind the plate. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what about, so I'd actually like to talk a little more about this JV program. So first of all, how many guys come out for your team these days? Like, is it 70 guys consistently? 65 to 75 um, that, every year. Is that, or do you have a proactive recruiting um, plan or is it is it based on just the success of the program and the attractiveness of it at this point? Yes, <laughs> both of those. Uh, you know, I'm trying to recruit every good athlete in the school and Very often, we don't always get the best athletes. We get a lot of kids who the first sport they've ever done is wrestling, ever. And they come out as a freshman or sophomore in high school. And, um, you know, when they, sometimes they have the aha moment and sometimes they stick it out for a year, maybe two. Um, Sometimes that kid stays for all four years and maybe gets one or two wins and you get them a couple varsity matches. Um, But, but I I, I think it's really important that we recruit within the building the best athletes we possibly can. We build a really great tradition. We've had a great tradition since, I mean, we've only had three coaches in 50 years of the school. Uh, mm-hmm. Coach Eppley was there for uh, mm-hmm. 21 years. Coach Hillbold was there for five and I've been there for 24. And then, you know, um, we're, we'll be at 50 years next year. So, you know, you have that tradition of the program being, having greatness and, uh, So you sell that, um, you sell the MMA aspect, you sell the, it works great as a benefit for football. It works great for a benefit for lacrosse. And you get some of those kids who they see it at first as their second sport. And then it becomes their first sport when they start getting success. So I I like the MMA aspect. Do, Do you do anything specifically around the MMA draw? Do you, uh, bring in any coaches who have expertise in that or no, not, we haven't. Uh, I, we probably should, uh, Robert Dooley, who was with us for, for a bunch of years and now he's out in California. He did a lot of jujitsu stuff and he would, 
play with it every now and then. And we've had some other guys come in, um, but not, not as much. But, you know, uh, a person you should really have on is Jason Planakis. He's now at Lee. He was at Marshall for a long time. And, you know, the way he recruits in, in buildings that aren't as easy, easy to recruit in as Robinson, um, it, uh, it really is a, is a – he does an amazing job of recruiting – every type of kid in the school seems like you travel more as a, a uh, as a as a coach than you, you did previous you guys do you go to more away tournaments more um, do, you, do you get out of northern Virginia more today than you did 10 years ago no I would say well probably not my first five years but after that I've told my kids for a long time I want the state tournament to be the e- one of the easier tournaments that they've been a part of all year I want them to see the mat, the, the, you know, 25 mats at the beast of the East and the Mm. 10 national rank kids in their weight class. And, you know, they, they might take a a butt kicking or they might give that kid a battle. Uh, But when they get to the state tournament, they're like, Oh, this, this is four mats in a high school gym. This is, this isn't an arena. This is, so I think that's important. I think it's important that kids travel with the national team to Fargo and go to Disney duels and to go to those things first to be around a diverse population with different demographics. And secondly, uh, to be battle tested. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if you're, you know, thinking that the state tournament is, you know, you're saucer dives when you get there, um, kids are going to struggle. You know, I, I agree with that. I, I, um, I know I was fortunate to quali- to, to qualify my sophomore year for the state tournament. And so when I, went back there and I was better and I, I was more, you know, I was a stronger wrestler. I was mentally able to, to perform better than, than I, than I was the first time I was there. Um, and I think that going to the beast of the East, these other tournaments, I'm sure that that has the same kind of, you know, effect on sure. people that really want to win the titles. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I don't take all my kids to those tournaments. You know, we've, we've had years where we've taken all 14 weight classes and we've had other years we've taken five. It, I, you also don't want to, you know, go get pinned twice, 0-2, and, and then sit for 17 hours in a gym. You want to be able to compete and, and, and you know, be a part of that. So I said I wasn't going to put you on the spot, but I am going to put you on the spot a little bit. So, um, so you know, the, the podcast is all about strengthening wrestling in Virginia. So what are what are some of the things that you see other coaches doing that really drive you nuts that you think, like, I wish, you know, we would have stronger teams if? Uh, number one, and I learned this from doing it myself and from watching, is berating kids, mm-hmm. is having that thought that a kid is doing something to spite you. They're going out there to lose because of you. Uh, No kid's going to do that. Uh, So I think, you know, going in and telling a kid how bad they suck in front of a lot of kids and a lot of parents and a lot of people, you'll never get that kid back. That's all they're going to remember is how negative you were. So I think positivity, especially, and you know, you can, you can be honest with them, right. But especially towards the end of the year, our kids are the greatest thing in the world. They're the, they're killers. They're, they're, there's nothing that can beat them. And I think those are things that you need to teach the kids is, you know, that's going to build that confidence. So that's number one. Uh, I think trying to have a kid be undefeated is really, you know, undefeated with 30 pins, then you're not getting a good enough competition. And when it gets down to the match, what's real tough you're, you're not going to have the uh, the get up and go that you need or and you're going to lose confidence if you give up that takedown. So you need to make them battle tested. So, you know, going and, and trying to trying to have a coach go and say, I had 300 dual meet victories, but only like 10 of them in those 300 were 14 on 14 dual meets. I, I think that's a problem. Um, I think I think coaches who strictly coach for their own benefit and think that this, I need this for me. And I, I, I think it's selfish. We don't make enough money and we don't, uh, you know, get enough benefits. And especially in wrestling, we don't, we're not going to get the positive press if you're only out there to see, you know, how good you can be and not trying to build up others. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to keep on rolling. If that's all right. Keep going. There's no time limit. I think 
coaches who don't ever put in uh, any results or don't ever put up any video or don't ever do anything on social media with their kids because they're afraid that um, people are going to steal their ideas. I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think coaches who won't let their kids train other places uh, is a problem. If you're going to try and just keep them, I want just Robinson kids here. Or I just want none of my kids can go anywhere else. I think it's a problem because then you're losing that uh, ability to see something different. Because my style might not work for Will Marlowe. Will Marlowe's uh, style might not work for Tyler Hazard. Uh, you know, those type of things. I think it's good that we go and see and branch out. Uh, I, I send my kids over to Tech Squad and to Gunston Wrestling Club and down to Woodbridge. And they bring kids to us uh, because – in the off season, you know, th that was some of my most fun times. Um, I think if you're going and saying, I'm only going to wrestle a national schedule in the off season, I don't want to ever be local. I think it's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, again, posting results is really a problem. I don't want anybody to know how our teams have done. I don't want anybody to know what my kids have done. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a weenie way out. I'm not going to stop you. If you want, you can keep you keep knocking other coaches down. No, I think I I just, I just see what kids, I I I see what what the coaches that win do, and yeah. the coaches that win on the college level, on the high school level, on the youth level, um, they're not thinking that they have all the answers. So what about so? This is a tactical question. So um, I've seen some wrestling rooms where the coaches want the guys wrestling live a lot throughout the season and they wrestle live. You know, I mean, I've heard of coaches putting guys wrestling live for 30 minute goes 45 minute goes throughout the, you know, you know, throughout a practice. And then other coaches want to, to be much more stingy about live wrestling. Where do you fall in that? Uh, in that camp? I, I'm, I'm a little bit more stingy especially when you, ha and I've been blessed to have really successful individual teams. Yeah. And when you put them wrestling live against each other, they want to win and they, yeah, they don't give up position and they get hurt. Um, you know, I think there is a time for live wrestling. I think in a, in a, in a season, the beginning of the season, uh, I do a little bit more teaching um, kind of middle of the season. We might do a little bit more live towards the end of the season. We might l wrestle live two to three minutes, situations in a practice. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, you drill it and drill it, and drill it until in live, it comes natural. Yeah. And, and I think those, that's something that coach Epperly taught me. That's something my dad taught me. Uh, that's something, you know, we have, uh, Andy Jimmo who coached with me for a long time, coach at South County, uh, then came back, coached with me for a while. Now he's our assistant AD at Robinson. He talks about the SOS, the same old stuff, he, he, we don't always say the same old stuff, but the SOS, the drills that you do every day that are your uh, drills that you have to do every day. Um, you know, you got to get off bottom every day. You have to, um, uh, you know, kind of get in those scramble positions every day. You have to go in finishing singles every day. You've got to go thumb in the head and squaring up and going behind every day. Um, you have to do, I call it a top drill where you're moving side to side on top and you're giving pressure. Um, you know, you go arm chop to far knee, far ankle, right to a spiral and to teach kids to keep their body on top. It's kind of like bull riding every day. And then from there you can branch out, but you know, six or seven drills that are, that you're, that are, you're going to be your drills. You have to do every single day and the kids are going to go, Oh, so boring. Those six or seven drills. Oh, it's SOS. But then when they get into a match situation, they know how to do it. I love it. I love it. I, and I, I agree with that. I mean, I know that from my perspective, we cut injuries down tremendously when we reduced live wrestling, yeah. you know, and, you know, there's no, you know, and other benefits came out of that. And, and so I, I, I certainly, uh, yeah, I, I fall on that, on that similar side. Yeah, I think it's I, I and again, there is a time and place for live and the kids love it. Yeah. You know, and often if I'm away doing a, an announcing gig and one of my assistant coaches is running practice and the kids will talk them into doing live, 
a little bit too much, you know, and every now and then it's really great for their psyche just to get in there and do an hour of, uh, you know, all live, do matches, all the whole practice and get out of there. Um, you know, that, I think that's a good thing. I think coming in late nights every now and then is a good thing. I think coming in really early every now and then is a good thing. Not every day. Um, just to simulate getting up in the morning and going into a match situation or wrestling late at night. You know, you got to train your body in, in, in every time and in every situation. So we're in the off season right now. And, and it's a weird off season. <laughs> this is really the off off season. Yeah, like, yeah. This is about as weird as it could get. Yeah. So what, you know, if you could have your, you know, your average wrestler doing one or two or three things right now, what would you have them doing? Stance of motion, stance of motion, stance of motion, stance of motion, you know, just staying oh. in that position for as long as possible. Um, you know, doing, doing some strength stuff, uh, a, a lot of pull, a lot of back stuff, a lot of pull-ups, a lot of, um, you know, getting in and digging and, and throwing a hammer around and, and, and hitting things to get, to get that farm boy strength. Uh, and then some more stance of motion. Uh, and just keeping that, you know, position and, and, you know, right at this point, cardio isn't super important, but getting that farm boy strength is really important. Getting that grip strength and, and, and staying in position and, and, you know, keeping that lower back really strong from, from doing that. And then, uh, you know, I think doing, doing film stuff, uh, watching and not watching themselves. But going on and watching last night, watching the rumble on the rooftop uh, in Chicago and and on the 25th, watching the the match in Austin, Texas with, you know, Chumiso and, and Dake, uh, watching old videos um, of, of, you know, whoever it might be, college wrestlers, high school wrestlers, international wrestlers, finding something that's that's fun to watch and that's, that, you know, that's enjoyable. I think that's great. I think that's great advice. Um, so, uh, normally when I'm talking to people on this podcast, I'm talking to act to wrestlers who about, you know, how they did and, and I'll ask them about nutrition, but might as well ask as the coach, what do you, do you give nutrition guidance? Are you, is that a part of the, the, you know, the guidance that you give your, your whole team? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, for five years, we had a coach named Paul Bresnan who wrestled down at York and went to um, CNU. He played football there and he came in and he put together a really nice nutrition package for our kids on, you know, kind of energy and energy, energy out things. And, you know, what, what you're doing, uh, what you're putting in your body. Um, you know, I think that's one of those things with the strength stuff and with the nutrition stuff, I'm not great with, but I am always going to recruit a coach or a person or a parent who's really good with it. And, and trust when you see somebody doing it right, that they might have, you know, the golden egg and they might know what's going on. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, during season energy in is so important. Uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, our team doesn't cut much weight. They have kids who lose weight and I've had kids cut a lot of weight and I hate it. And it's always been out of necessity if they have to do it, as long as it's within the, the weight management rules going down to that 7%. Um, because, you know, if you if it, if a kid wants to start, sometimes they might have to sacrifice that weight cut. Sure. Have that, have that other kids, kids refuse and take a spot for a kid who's and that stinks. It's the worst thing. It breaks my heart. It makes me sick to my stomach because a, a kid might lose a spot. Um, and I've had that happen uh, several times. And it's you know it's no fun for that kid. But uh, I I think you know the the energy and stuff is is really important and how you're how you are able to go through your two hour practice. Cause we don't do a lot of slow goes. We do everything high pace, high motion, uh, teaching as we go, no more than one or two minutes of talk uh, and then get some, and we try to get them right back out because I'm the same way, but I would say even more in this day and age, if you talk too much kids, you lose them really quickly. Mm -hmm. They just, Squirrel, you know, they're, they're, they're out and about before you even know it. I was lucky. I had one of the assistant coaches all four years for me at Yorktown was Noel Loban. It's the best. 
amazing wrestler. He and he would tell all kinds of great stories. And he told about how he cut 20, 25 pounds one year and didn't do anything at the NCAA tournament. And then he he went up a weight class. He went and, up to one went up to one ninety that one year, and he he did really well. He was third in the Olympics. Yeah. I love it. He's got the best accent in the world. He does. Yeah, you can do a better Logan than I can, maybe. <laughs> he, I remember the first time I shook his hand and his hand like attacked my whole – he was shaking it up here. He yeah. just, he's a monster of a man. And just, gosh, what a – I mean, he's a, he's a special human being. He sure is. Yeah, I'd love to get him back up to, to Virginia for a clinic. You know, he uh, he had these long arms, and he could he could do cradles on anybody. Anybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He, he taught us. He taught us good. You know, so those years we did a lot of cradles. Yeah. No, he's he's still. I was over um, coach at NC State's a good friend of mine, and uh, he's he's with them a bunch. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he's in their room, and he's he's probably what almost almost sixty almost now, right? Maybe even yeah. older. You know, you you wouldn't know it really to look at him, but yeah. No, he looks younger than I do. <laughs> Yeah, well, and he was obviously as sophisticated as as it, as it got, and uh, so he taught us about nutrition, taught us about ex you know the right kinds of of exercise, and and really, you know, he so we got wonderful guidance on on that. In addition to, I mean, what more could you ask from a technician? I mean, you know, he. Although I do remember there would be times where he would. Um, I remember he Pete and I one time were wrestling in the off season, and he came in and he said, "No, no, do it, do it like this, Holmes," and. Uh, and and he and he did this other move and 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 had Pete on his back and he said, "Wow, that was really good." Like, what what is that move? He said, "Well, you know, I just made it up." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, kind of going back to our first question yeah. uh, of the, it helps to have really incredible athletes. <laughs> it helps to have guys who like that can just do it, and they can't figure out why you can't figure it out. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, he was on a whole nother plane. Yeah. Man, he's just same with Coach Jeffrey Mallet, who who little Jeff, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, who I hey, think, hey, how you doing? Hey, come on, we gotta get this done now. I love Jeff. He's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get him on the podcast before long too, because he he was a two time state champion in Missouri. Yep. And then um, Olympic alternate, um, and I don't know. He had I think he was a Pan American champion maybe. And was he five one oh five and a half or one fourteen? He was a little guy. Yeah, yeah he was fourteen and a half, I believe. And he was a Marine, right? Yeah, he was four or five time armed forces champion. Yeah, he was he was special. He's he's awesome. Yeah, outstanding. So yeah, I had four years with him. I mean, what more can you ask for for a, a wrestling partner? Now that said, you made a comment that your coaches are not wrestling partners. Not what all of them. By that. Not all of them. Um, I I I would say in the last fourteen years, I've maybe wrestled in the room during season twice, three times. You know, in the, last, in the last 14 years, did you say? Yeah, probably. Wow. My first several years, I did a lot of wrestling with guys. Yeah. Uh, in the last 14, maybe 15 years, I, I've done almost none. Um, you know, I think we've had some young guys who come in and are practice partners. But I like I like to have coaches who can go around and watch, take small groups. Uh, you know, we have a system and we have our SOS, and but we also have some coaches who might take a group in the corner and work on a specific thing. Uh, mm -hmm. take three or four guys or after practice, have a notes and say, okay, these five guys, you're staying with me and we're going to work on a specific situation. I mean, they can be in the room and they can do practices, but, but, it, you know, you don't, you're going to have guys that for the three, 400 bucks you pay them, that that's what they want to do. Um, but I also have had some coaches who come in the room and have to win and, Mm. you know, at all costs, they've got to win. They've got to beat that guy in front of them. And it's not good because they're punishing kids. I, I've, I've had to unfortunately ask a few not to come back or say you can't come back in, unless, you know, you're willing to give up some points every now and then or give up some position and not just hammer a guy and beat him into the ground because that's not helping a kid either. I would say you have more experience than I do in this, but I would say that a lot of assistant coaches 
want to come in to be wrestling partners. You know, that is a that is what they think of when they think of coaching is they're going to do a lot of wrestling. Right. And, and the hard work of coaching is not doing that. It's writing out the practice plans. It's 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 doing the the less glamorous, less physical work sometimes. Oh, yeah. What you're doing isn't always sexy. I can tell you that it's, uh, you know, you're and, and even for the coaches who can really visualize what the kids are doing and can move kids. I was actually talking with Quentin Wright, who was two time NCAA champ from Penn State the other day. And we were laughing because he has got this great underhook series and he was a college. Uh, we went to Penn State for camp one year and he was blowing the whistle. Him and David Taylor and Ed Ruth were all in a row and they were all national champs like two years later. And so Quentin was the referee in our match against some other team in Pennsylvania. And I can remember him and we still talk about it all the time blowing the whistle in the middle of the match and stopping what the kids were doing and making them drill a situation because they had done it wrong mm. in that live situation or in that live match. And so it was funny. Uh, it's one of my greatest memories. And, and it made my eyes open as a coach that, Hey, you, sometimes you got to give up position and say, Hey, you got it right here, right here, right here and let them finish and let them get that confidence and, or stop them in the middle and say, okay, finish that situation, but then stop and say, no, let's try to do it right. And let's drill that four or five times and get it right. So you're, you're not building those bad habits. So what other things do you do? It sounds like you're very intentional about building confidence in wrestlers. 100%. What, what, what are, what are some of the other things you do to, to build that confidence? Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, telling kids how good they are, Try not to beat them up, not to build, build, you know, always building them up for, for every bad thing you're going to say to one of your athletes, you need three or four good things to say about them um, because they're going to remember the way you talk to them. And I can tell you, I don't always do it as a dad as well as I do it as a coach. Um, let's see. Um, we do a lot of, you know, we've in the last couple of years, um, some intentional leadership training with our kids to give them a, at least they feel like they have a say. Mm -hmm. and, and what's going on. Um, because if they feel like they have some ownership of what's going on, they're much more likely to have confidence when it comes down to it. If they think that they made it up, they're going to feel much better about it when it works. <laughs> um, um, I, I think a lot of the, the drilling that we do, we'll bring kids in and in, in groups after practice or during practice, and we'll fix one situation, one technique. And then when they get it done, right. Yeah. It's the greatest thing in the world. And, and in a match, you know, not screaming the whole time and telling them, oh, you're doing it wrong, but trying to coax them into doing it right and, and you know, not making a loss the, the worst thing ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I won't do it. If a kid's going out and giving effort, I'm never going to go and tell them they sucked or that they weren't good enough. Um, so those type of things, especially with a really tough schedule, I think it's important that you – are as positive as you can possibly be. And if you're not, I don't think you're doing uh, the kids a service. You're doing them a disservice. Um, and there's other things, you know, some, um, we, we do a lot of inspirational quote stuff, especially mm -hmm. in the week before postseason. we'll start, I, my propaganda starts coming out and I'll find little quotes and little things to tell them at the end of practice. Mike Mukai, who's been one of our assistant coaches for, 10 years and he was a principal at, at our school. Now he's the principal at West Springfield, but his son wrestled for us. He finds little trinkets for them uh, to, to give, you know, on a necklace and they might have five or six things at the end of the year. And there's always some type of a reason why. And I think, you know, you give kids reasons that, and you get things in their head and then they believe it. I also like what you said about not making, not going for that undefeated record. You know, the you know, I, I've even heard about and I think there's a lot to the idea of redefining success in a certain in a certain sense where, you know, you could go out and, and wrestle a match where you are overmatched for a guy. You could beat him and pin him and you've got a pin. But did you do the, Did you apply the things you were supposed to apply? Did you was your head in it? Were you did you have the right attitude? Did you grow? Um, and if, if those things aren't the case, then was it a successful match? And, right. you know, I think, I think that there is something to be said for 
taking a proactive focus on those things that are in their control, because you don't really have control over who you wrestle. You as the coach have control over potentially who a kid wrestles to a certain extent, but the kid is going to go out there and wrestle whoever it is. So yeah. that's out of their control, right? good or bad. Uh, these other things are in their control. It's something that they can, you know, they, they can, they, they can grow or they can not grow. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, we talk about control the controllables all the time. That's one of our little quotes mm -hmm. that we give. Control the controllables, your effort, um, you know, your, your preparation, your position. Um, sometimes you get rolled up and you get your tail waxed, you know, and, and you don't have control over that. But I can remember, uh, I'll give an instance. We took a team, one of our really, we had a bunch of really good teams and we would go to the Ironman up in Ohio. And uh, my 106 pounder, who was a returning state place winner, um, had to wrestle this kid from St. John Bosco in California, little mm -hmm. guy with huge teeth and uh, 106 pounder. My kid was good. And he was, uh, you know, wasn't seated and he got teched, got teched quick. And it was Zaid Valencia. Uh, you know, um, another one of my kids, Brandon Grayson, um, was at that same tournament at the Ironman and uh, had to wrestle a kid from Franklin Regional in the first round. And he he scored a takedown, I think, or got a point. And everybody's like, wow, it was Spencer Lee. You know, that, so the fact that uh, we had a heavyweight, um, Jake Pinkston, who in boys club wrestled Kyle Snyder every year over and over again and never beat him. But, but they had some battles. And ipso facto, man, he was like a – he was a he was an almost an Olympic champion, right? Because he got to wrestle Kyle all the time. So we try to we try to give those kids the kids those type of situations too. So um, another hypothetical question for you: Let's say you are transplanted into a totally different high school, brand how many, new. How many years ago? Today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know you've got you've got to build a wrestling program. You got twenty guys come out. 20 guys, you know, uh, to come out to wrestle. What, what, are, what are five things that you would do with this brand new wrestling program, starting it from scratch to get it off on the right foot so that it, so that, so that it, in the years to come, it would be a really strong program. I mean, and, and you know, a question for you, am I coming in right at the beginning of the season or am I coming in at the beginning of the school year where I have some time to get to know the kids and to work with them and take them to football games and to, to try and build that camaraderie first. I mean, so you started to answer the question. I love it. Right. I, I think, I think you have to build that team. Uh, I think you have to build that. Um, I think you need to give them um, really two techniques in every position that they have to master, you know, a stand up, um, maybe a, maybe a, a changeover and a stand up. I think are two things on the bottom that they have to know. I think, uh, you know, uh, an outside step, a single and a, and a sprawl, I think they have to learn and how to finish those those two techniques. And on top, one go to something where they can capture something in order to score. I don't think you need to teach 100 moves. I think every kid needs four or five that they need to do really, really well. From every of those five positions, you can branch off into 100 more. Uh, so I think you need to be really uh, intentional about planning, keeping it small and especially if those kids have never wrestled before um i think um you know you need to build leadership and you need to figure out who your two or three leaders are going to be i haven't chosen captains or had voted on captains in the last 14 or 15 years um mm -hmm. every kid takes a leadership role and the the cream really rises those kids you don't have so robinson does not have captains no no, because, I mean, we've been really successful and every kid expects to be the best one on the team. And so if you give someone a title, I, I just think sometimes it breaks the other kids down. Um, we did captains for many years because those kids really rose. Um, right now with my 11 seniors who we have coming up next year, I'm doing the NFH NFHS captains class where that's online and we talk about it. And we do a, a Zoom call once a week and we do a question and answer and we discuss, you know, how we want to, what, what are some really important things and what role is this scene you're going to have? And, you know, it, it's, it's been really cool. Um, let's see. So again, couple, you know, building that camaraderie, going out together, spending time together, getting to know each other on a much deeper level. 
uh, a couple of techniques that are really, really important. Uh, finding leaders uh, in your in your school and in your room. Finding an assistant coach who knows more than you do. I think that's really important. Uh, if you're, you know, even after many years, I ask a lot of questions of my assistants. What do you think? Help me figure this out. You know, get with this. Let's let's do this. Um, and uh, and finding a youth club or finding uh, a youth coach who is going to build that next level. I think those four or five things are, are the most important things you can do as a coach. Uh, I, I know it's a struggle for you, but being in the building for me or having a coach in the building is of utmost importance for me. Um, and I've been in the building for 24 years, but I've also had other coaches because kids are going to want to go talk to someone they trust or – they're going to need to be around somebody who they know has their back in their worst situations. Uh, and there's a lot more that goes into it than athletics. I mean, kids struggle when they get in a, the worst breakup of their life. That That's the worst thing that's ever happened in their life or when their parents get into a fight or when their parents get a divorce or when their parent loses a job or when there's a death in the family or when something happens with a friend. I think it's really important that we are able to have – some confidants in that are, that are older, that they really trust. Yeah. And so from my perspective, I'm not in the school. Um, and you know, that means that I do have to work hard to try to, to make sure that my communication with the, with the guys is, uh, uh, is really good. And, and I try to go above and beyond on that because I, I, I agree. I think it is a disadvantage to not, you know, I think the more contact you have, the more communication, the better. So obviously if you're not in the school by definition, you're, you're there's less communication. So, you know, I, I, I do see that as something where, you know, it's just, it's just a challenge to try to, to try to make sure that you're, you know, you're doing more to, to, to stay in touch with everybody. Right. And, you know, and, and kind of looking at numbers, I'm the National Wrestling Coach Association state chairman and the average coach stays for used to be three to five, now closer to three years. Um, so and these new coaches are coming in. They have no ability to know the institutional knowledge of the school, uh, the history of the school, the alumni. I'm really fortunate. Again, I'm an alumnus of the school and I'm part of the community and I'm in the building. And, you know, I reach out to the former coaches and to the wrestlers and to the alumni. You know, I try to do it weekly. It doesn't always happen. But uh, I have a good relationship with our alumni. Um, and they're proud that they hear from me once once a week during season and once a month off season a lot of times. Um, you know, we talk babies. We talk funerals. We talk marriages. We talk graduations. Um, we talk promotions. Uh, and, you know, we when you have successful people – uh, we want those, we want our kids in front of those successful people who have come from the same program and come from the same place. Well, I know that when my coach was coach Scott Brooks and he, he used to talk about wrestling, creating a fraternity for life. And, you know, I remember he said, you know, if you're, you know, if you're going out for a job and, you know, that other guy on the other side of that table is a wrestler. You better believe you're going to get that job. And yeah, I mean, that stuck with me. <laughs> it's true. It, it, is. It, is, it is one of those sports where uh, that's why we have wrestling and business networks now. I mean, you buy from a buy from a wrestler, hire yeah. a wrestler. I think, you know, and it's something that's uh, that's it's a special thing. Three of my clients are wrestlers and uh you know, I think there's a, there's absolutely a, a strong connection that comes from that. Definitely. So what, um, is there any one coach or, or role model that you've had as a coach that has influenced you a lot, that's helped you build the program? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I try to morph a lot. Obviously I had great, great coaches growing up. I mean, my dad was my coach from when I was five until I was, 20, let's say just in the, and, and then I had coach Epperly, who's you know, also in the, my dad's in the hall of fame. Coach Epperly was in the hall of fame. He did things a lot different than I do. He's very introverted. Everything was written down. Um, so people like him, uh, Mike Moyer in, in, in college, who was different, but more of a salesman and a recruiter, um, you know, uh, guys like Roy Hill who just build kids up and, and, uh, 
Eric Burnett up in up in uh, Ohio at Illyria who have taken kids and in, in a rough area and, and made them great. I, I don't know if there's any one. I, I, uh, Wade Hughes, who coached me, who was the head coach at Howard University, um, but was my kind of my growing up. My dad, uh, he he Wade worked with my mom, and my dad said, "Wade, take him," uh, you know. And, and he we worked one on ones, you know, for for three or four years growing up. And uh, so I don't know. I I've stolen so much. Very little of what I do is mine. I mean, if any of it, I've I've stole so much. Uh, every little thing um, that I do, it comes from somebody and my kids would be like, hey, that one sounded like Coach Krause. That one sounded like Coach Burnett. Hey, that counts like Coach uh, Fretwell. Hey, you know what? That was like Coach uh, um, Javin Saleha from, uh, you know, Ahad and or whoever it was. We bring guys in, the Bella Glossoffs. Uh, so I don't know if there's any one that I can pinpoint to say I wanted to be like him. I think Coach Epperly's, you know, the guy who, I wanted to take over Robinson's program and, mm-hmm. and did that. Uh, you know, I obviously, um, you know, my dad was, was, was a huge influence still is. I, you know, we still talk wrestling every, you know, at least once or usually daily, but once or twice a week, we'll, we'll chat about it. So. That's great. That's great. Well, coach hazard, thank you so much for being on. My Matt, on, I almost called it um Matt talk or Matt, <laughs> <laughs> Matt time Matt time yeah I almost got it so coach hazard thank you so much for being on back points you've been a great guest really appreciate what you're doing at Robinson and uh and and I know people are going to benefit from all the all the advice you you've imparted at this uh on the in this interview oh I appreciate you having me and anytime you ever need anything uh please feel free to reach out I'm uh unfortunately an open book sometimes it it's not always where I need to be, but uh, I, you know, I love to I love to help as well as I can. Well, thanks again. All right, Will. Thank you. All right. See you. Thanks for listening to Back Points today. If you want to support the show, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you find the show. Also, it helps us if you give the show a rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Feel free to also make a donation via Patreon at patreon.com slash backpoints. Thanks and see you next episode.